Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to Salina Media Connected. I'm your host, Greg Stevens, and today I have a special guest, Honorable Scott Swab, who is the 32nd Secretary of State for Kansas. Uh, Scott grew up around Great Bend, I understand, yep. and then went to Fort Hayes State, yep, which I did I also. <laughs> that's a good school. Uh, and then he ended up in Eastern Kansas. How'd that happen? Well, I was working for Farm Bureau at the time out in Ellis County, and I had an opportunity to transfer to Wyandotte County, and I was looking for a bigger market. And while there at a big church in Johnson County, I met my wife and didn't know she was going to be my wife, but it ended up that way and been married for over 23 years. And then uh, you eventually ran for office in, was it the 49th district or was it a different one? No, it was the 49th district. It was a redistricting year back after the, after 2000. And my wife was finishing up med school. She asked me what I wanted to go do. And I was in healthcare at the time. And I didn't know if I wanted to go to law school or run for office. So I took my LSAT, um, ended up running for office. And she said, well, just go to law school when you're no longer elected. And after this much time, I'm not, I'm not, I have no plans to go back to law school ever. What did you major in at Hayes? Yes, so I was a photojournalism major and oh, kind of wow. got the political bug. And um, with that comms degree, almost got a, a poli sci minor. I think I was one or two hours short, but I didn't want to go back for an additional year to get that because I didn't think it enhanced much as it relates to my ability to get work. And uh, what year did you start serving in the House? My first term was in 2003. I did a oops, I'm running for US Congress back in 2006, but the person who replaced me in the 49th district did not finish his term. I got appointed back in 2008. So I did miss one full session and most of that 2008 session, but then got reelected in 08 and continued to serve until we became Secretary of State in 2018. 2018. And uh, as I recall, there was a crowded primary yeah. And our local Republican, Randy Duncan, uh, received 20% of the vote. You received around 38%. That sounds right. And then went on to uh, win the election. So let's talk about elections because I understand this year is the year for municipal elections, which include uh, city commissioners and school board members and depending on the community did some other offices Correct. uh is it, will that be a partisan election this year or how does that work well most most communities are they're, they're not partisan so depending on the number of candidates technically there's still a primary which is the first tuesday following the first monday in august and that's pretty far off my radar so i don't remember the exact date but it's it's consistent with that if there's more than if there's three or more candidates filing for a position that triggers a primary to narrow it down to two. If there's only two candidates, there is no primary for that particular seat. It just goes on to the general in November. And so while parties often get involved in those races, there is not your traditional this is the nominee or a primary who is the nominee in August and then they move on to November. They are nonpartisan in that sense, whereas, however, everything's becoming more partisan. You're seeing uh, both the Democrat Party, Republican Party, and even the Libertarian Party getting involved more in school district races and city council races. And some, I mean, they're not so much in um, some of the local community college races, if there's a local community board or a water district board. But even in some of those in the eastern side of the state, we are seeing the parties engage more in those races. So it's probably a good thing because, you know, we have a tendency to vote more in presidential elections, but those school board races really have the higher effect on your day-to-day uh, -day life. So uh, help me understand how you have a primary without it being partisan. Yeah. We call it primary just because it's easier, but really it, for a term, because there's really no other term for the way Kansas does it. So let's say you have a particular ward in the city and there's five people running. The top two vote getters move on to the November election, it, as opposed to having um, just everybody vote in November. It's always been that there's been a primary than a general. But back in 2006, I want to believe it would. They said it used to be a primary no matter how many people were on the ballot. But to save money on counties, 
the, if the primary didn't have an effect on the general, which means there's only two candidates and it's going to be the same two candidates in November, they didn't have to spend the money on that primary because it really was just an exercise that had no effect. So we still call it a primary and all it is is to kind of thin down the number of people whose names are on the ballot, but you can still do a write-in as in with any election. Wasn't it true that uh, in years past, we didn't put the party affiliation for these uh, municipal and school board elections? And is will that be the same in this coming year or this year? Wow, I cannot remember how they do it because municipal elections are run by the county. So we really don't run them from our office. And I cannot remember the statute if they put that on there. I know there was a push so folks could at least know which parties voting in municipal elections. But again, those local elections we aren't engaged in because they're, they're not state elections as opposed to district attorneys, the legislature, and also our federal seats and the governor and statewide like, like our, our own office. But these local, we don't even post election results as it relates to municipal and school board elections because they're completely run by that county. And when the county board of canvassers meet to certify their elections, as opposed to state board of canvassers meeting to certify it in these local elections, it's completely run by the county and they certify it and they don't even hand those numbers up to us. Okay. So uh, for those that want to run for either one of these uh, elections, uh, what's the deadline to filing, Scott? Uh, June 1st, and June that's 1st. the same with every election year. So if you're looking at running for the legislature next year, you have till June 1st, or, you know, folks are running for governor and such like that as well. What's the, is there a filing fee for that? Uh, yes, there are fees. Depending on the office you run for, the, the larger the office, the higher the, the, the fee, the smaller the office, the smaller the fee. And that's kind of what helps fund our office a little bit. Um, and it also is what helps to a degree fund the ethics commission, although some of the lobbying char fees charge are more funding for ethics, but it's kind of what keeps that elections division alive down in our office. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the Secretary of State's office. I noticed your webpage has changed a little bit. Uh, it used to be KSSOS and now it's Kansas.gov. Is that right? Or It's SOS.gov. It's sos.ks.gov. And when you do the .gov, it comes with some security measures that a .org or a .com does not come with. What we're seeing is a lot more foreign actors are trying to impersonate a government website. And so by having that .gov, you get some federal monitoring and protections that prevent somebody from doing an imitation site and giving out false information. So has Kansas had attempts to hack our election process? Not the election process per se. Um, now, when it comes to like websites and servers, if you have a server, someone's trying to attack it. It's just it's just part of being in the IT world. As it relates to our elections, it, it's not so much the election process, it's the narrative and news stories. We do see in Kansas that even born out of foreign nations, they put on social media false stories to try to create, um, oh, just discord and, anger and angst to show that Western democracies don't work even in Kansas. Um, we don't run into too much of a situation where people have reacted to that, but we are seeing the articles from time to time. As it relates to people hacking our processes, our voting machines are never on a network, so it would be difficult to hack, and as well as our tabulators are on, never on a network. So again, it's hard to have someone try to interfere with that. Our bigger concerns are our poll book, which we put in stringent security measures to make sure that has not been messed with, and high protocol. And also on websites, we protect our website pretty tight, again, with that .gov, because the last thing we want to have happen, for example, last presidential election, people start back through a backdoor hack, manipulating numbers and just anything that would cause people not to be confident in the results and the way they're coming in. So that those are the processes we're more concerned about. Not so much hacking the actual vote because it's not on a network to be hacked. Now, security goes beyond just hacking. It's also making sure people can vote in person safely. It's also making sure those counties understand the processes so that nobody's being manipulated. For example, if they need help with a reading a ballot, that there's two people there to make sure that no one's being 
um, given false information to sway a vote one way or another. So if you're working at a poll, you know, there's Democrats and Republicans working in those poll sites. And, and that, that, a real quick plug, if you're 16 or above, we would encourage you to work in this upcoming election. Uh, you don't have to be 18. You can be 16 or 17. We work with student service program out of our office. So you get credit at school for serving in an election. And what's nice about that, especially folks who are concerned about whether it's uh, voter suppression or voter, um, uh, voter fraud, go work an election. Go get trained and go work as a poll worker. You'll find out the number of layers of security we put in place to make sure that when we get election results, they can be trusted. How do you, as a student, get credit for working in an election? Well, it's up to the teacher, but normally it's on a Tuesday, so they, they, they're going to be missing some school. And the training is often during the week, so they're going to miss school for that. Most teachers just have them write a paper about their experience and what they've learned. And by submitting that, they get additional credit and an excused absence. Okay. And it's a so, great civic duty for students to get involved in, to learn about their community and serve their community. They aren't able, <clears throat> so they aren't able to quiz out of a class or something like that because they do. This. No, I don't. I, no, no, no. I don't. I don't. I mean, it's up to the individual school district what they want to do, but I haven't heard of anything that they get completely quiz out of a class because they serve one day in an election. Well, I know there's been some discussion about requiring students to take a civics test. Yes, uh, that's a conversation. This could be part legislature. of that too. It, it, that would be a policy decision by the legislature. How is how's that going? Have they you know been what? debating that yet? It, you know, we're over here. That doesn't really touch our agency, so we don't follow that so much. We're more okay. concerned about the election bills and service of process and business filings and things like that going through the legislature because our office doesn't deal with public K-12 through education or university education system. So there have been also bills related to the election process, given uh, what's happened on the national scene uh, uh, in Georgia. I think it's H1, S1, uh, Kansas has had some discussions. What can you tell us about that? Well, I think our, lo our local, you know, Jamie there in Saline County does an absolute fantastic job running that county, county elections and state elections in Saline County. And our, no one's questioning the results as it relates to Kansas. And Kansas does a good job. We have good policy and that's why we've always advocated for no drastic changes. The legend or the Congress is looking at drastic changes, which frustrate us because they put standards in place that some of our more rural counties don't have the resources to do. And it also basically negates voter ID. Part of the reason why so many folks do trust Kansas elections is because we can check an ID to make sure a voter is in fact who they say they are, as opposed to someone coming from Missouri to go vote in Jack Johnson or Wyandotte County. And so we want to make, we're, that's why we're huge in engaging in that situation as it relates to the U.S. Congress. Uh, Jerry Moran has been very outspoken and has worked closely with our office as it relates to fighting that initiative to change federal law. Again, it, I trust Jamie and Saline County way more than I trust anybody in Congress to run an election. And if Congress really wants to push an initiative to hijack it, it's really going to make it confusing for voters in Kansas because they're going to upset our processes. And that's one thing we really don't want to see happen. Um, one of the items I noticed in preparing for this visit with you, Scott, was uh, gerrymandering. Uh, isn't it, don't we need to uh, reduce gerrymandering in elections? Uh, well, gerrymandering is more about redistricting and drawing right. district lines, and that's the legislature draws their own district, except for almost 10 years ago, actually, the federal court drew the lines. We play no role in redistricting whatsoever, so what we do is we receive the official census numbers, which they're running incredibly late this year. Um, it's very disappointing that the U.S. Census Bureau is not calculating as quickly as they should. Um, but once we're just the official officer of the filer of those, once we receive those, we hand those over to the governor and the legislature, and the legislature does the redistricting. And we have no say on that. And of course, the Secretary of State, the state line doesn't change. We're, we're elected statewide here. So, but gerrymandering is drawing a district to protect an elected official. And it's kind of difficult to say when that's happening and when it's not because the legislature is doing it. Some states have an independent board that does it, but 
you know, you can't take politics out of a political activity and drawing lines is just a political activity. But according to the Kansas constitution, the legislature draws those lines and, and then runs on that. And it forces a bipartisan agreement on those lines. But what that will look like, or if it's gerrymandered, it, it just the legislature will be the legislature. It will be court tested. There will be a lawsuit. There has to be a lawsuit just to make sure that the third branch of government says, no, the law was not violated or the constitution was not broken. Some of these districts look pretty awkward. Now, I'm not saying in Kansas, but you look at some of the the districts in uh, some of the eastern states, uh, raise some questions about well, and the legitimacy of that. Yeah, and I, I think that's, any, that's in this H1S1 bill, which is to reduce gerrymandering and maybe have a nonpartisan group uh, determine what the districts are rather than make it a, pol a political thing. Yeah, and that's a that's a policy decision by the Congress. We're more concerned about them interrupting our policies to carry out an election. The legislative bod bodies are the ones who draw redistricting, and that's not our concern. We want to make sure we focus on the lane of which we constitutionally and legally have an obligation to do, and we have no role in redistricting, especially any districts outside of the United States. But my concerns with H1 or S1, for example, we have to keep... Um, early advance voting open in every county 15 days for 10 hours a day. We have rural counties that can't afford the rent or the payroll to hire poll workers to work that far out from election when no one's even going to come in to vote yet. Um, those are our concerns. Our other concern with H01S1 is, again, it eliminates voter ID. So then we can have people coming from Missouri or Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, passing a line to vote and go back. And there's no way to prosecute or hold them accountable because we don't have an ID or a record of who that individual was. And we can't record because, again, ballots are meant to be secret. So those are our concerns with it. There's, and, and this is what kind of what the Kansas City Star alluded to is there's so much in H1S1 that that is multi-subject matters, it gives everybody a lot of pause, which is why they haven't passed it despite having majorities in both chambers because it's got a lot in it and not everybody's willing to vote for all of it. And the House did, and it was not a wide margin, and the Senate seems to be struggling to get to numbers. And you know, there's a lot in there. There's ethics in there too. I'm not concerned about that. That's the Congress's issue. I'm not concerned about the redistricting. That's their issue. I just don't want them disrupting the way we elect people in Kansas, which is what DC is trying to do right now. So there has been a pretty sharp debate about uh, elections the last week or two in Kansas. So uh, what exactly is the, are the changes that might occur as a result of that? Um, what there was a debate. I'm trying to remember some of it. Um, most, mo none of it has passed both chambers yet. So, but some of the debate, there was a bill introduced to change when how long an, an advance mail ballot can be received. That's stuck in committee. Um, it's an exempt committee, so they could meet again, but the legislature's breaking Friday. So they would have to pass that from committee and from the floor between now and Friday, and that'd be a heavy lift for anybody to do. Some of the other bills they've been talking about was ballot harvesting, which is not only a national conversation, but literally you could collect 2,000 ballots and drop them off at the county office. The legislature has a policy issue with somebody doing that. What the number should or should not be is a policy discussion for them. Has well, that been a problem in Kansas? You know, I, I, you hear <laughs> anecdotal evidence. Um, we haven't seen anything legitimately, but there are legislators who admitted to turning in over 100 ballots um, as they go and collect ballots and encourage people to it, turn in their advance mail ballot. And those advance requests are public. So it's nothing new for legislators to go door to door and ask for them, those people voting by advance mail to vote for them. It's just typical campaign, but you do have people collecting over a hundred and turning them in. Is that, should that be Ill illegal? That is a policy conversation for the legislature because they're the ones who decide what is legal and what's not. And that was a vigorous debate. Some of the other debates and bills in the legislature really haven't been nearly that controversial. That's the main one. Um, a lot of people talk about a lot of quote unquote anti-voter bills being introduced. But people introduce bills all the time that never see the light of day. They just want to be able to say they introduced the bill. That doesn't necessarily mean they, they passed a law. And so when folks see some of these bills, you just got to kind of temper it just because somebody introduced an idea, whether it's a far leftist or someone far on the right, a bill introduced does not necessarily make a law. 
Okay. Uh, anything else you want to say about uh, that early voting act? I understand Kansas went on record as with other secretaries of states uh, in opposition to it. And you pretty much outlined your reasons why, but if there's anything else you want yeah, to say? Yeah, we passed, a, um, that was the other thing, I guess it did pass, I, I, just, I forgot about it. The, the uh, joint, uh, basically a resolution condemning the passage of SR1, HR1. And we, they have reasons internally why they supported that. But again, our biggest concern is we don't want drastic changes to our election law, whether it's done in Topeka or whether it's done in the Congress. And HR1 would be a drastic change. And the reason why Kansas wasn't part of the national conversation, the reason why everybody trusts that our election results were true is simply because of our policy that we have and they're within a framework that our local uh, county election officials can carry out and provide, and with, provide true results. And they, then they audit those results to verify that in fact, the results are true and can be trusted. Whether or not you like the results is a different story. So that's why we're against HR1, SR1. I believe that's why the legislature was against it. It's simply because Kansas doesn't have an issue of fraud or massive, or massive suppression. We, we're a good state. You want to vote, go vote, go vote. We, in 2016, we had over 800,000 people vote in the presidential election. This last year, we had 1.3 million. And nobody's questioned the quality or the experience of the vote. So if that's the case, our stance is we don't need a drastic change either at the federal level or the state level. Uh, some people might uh, suggest that this is the great civil rights movement of, of our generation. The legislation is? Uh, yeah. What's happening would, as a result of what's going on in Georgia and the legislation. Well, uh, and we need to correct the narrative on some of that. Is Georgia expanded their early in-person voting. Now, I don't know why you can't get someone a bottle of water, but they did expand their early in-person voting. And as a matter of fact, they have more in-person early advanced voting than New Jersey does. So that creates a conversation on a narrative that's not entirely true. But as it relates to Kansas, if there's a Georgia issue, then let Georgia deal with it. But don't force Kansas to change something because the Congress doesn't like what Georgia did. Kansas is not a problem. And I don't think we should have to have uh, Georgia senators or California state, California members of Congress tell Kansas how to pull off an election when they haven't even been here. Okay. So uh, we've talked about the upcoming elections. We've talked about some of the national uh, events that are in legislation that's taken place. Uh, what do you see on the horizon? Um, we're going to continue to see um, international interference. Uh, we're going to continue to see false articles online, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram. And so we're always asking folks to be vigilant. If you read an article or a headline that says something, or even a, a GIF that says something, that strikes a strong emotion, let that be your sense that it may not be true. Is and there anything that, that your office can do to counter that? Or, I mean, what, what you're continue. saying is absolutely agreeable, uh, but maybe it's gonna take some people speaking out more locally about some of the things that is being passed around that's not true. Yeah, and we've been pretty vocal about that, whether it's on um, various local uh, news outlets and in our newsletter, and also as an association of secretaries of state, we've been very vocal, both social media and national news outlets. It's You can't stop it. It's an international fight between our military and um, those in other nations who are trying to change the narrative as it relates to the Western democracy. The best thing our office can do is continue to let folks know, if you read some online that strikes a strong emotion, First question you got to ask yourself is, do you know for a fact it's true? And if you can't find other so um, sources that try to validate that or verify it, then don't pass it, don't share it. I, it's sad that we have to say this, but we say it all the time. Just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's true. But there's a lot of folks that do share things on the internet that they do not verify as being true, simply because it's a, it meets a narrative that they think about, whether you're to the left or to the right. And therefore you want the people that you share things and see your Facebook or Instagram account and you share it 
and not knowing that you're playing in the hands of a foreign nation state that is trying to put false information in the public eye of the American people. So we just have to keep talking about it and let folks know just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's true. Okay, good point. Well, Scott, it's uh, been a pleasure talking to you and I uh, appreciate you taking the time to share with our viewers some important issues. In fact, democracy is pretty much built upon uh, citizen involvement and that's the office that you're responsible for. So I really appreciate you uh, uh, visiting with us and uh, good luck in your future. And if you have uh, a chance, maybe we can get back together again sometime and talk some more. Look forward to it and hopefully we can talk about other things because normally the things we like to talk about, it gets taken up by COVID conversation. So I'm glad we didn't have to do that we this didn't, time. Yeah, Thank we didn't sir. get into much COVID. Yeah, glad, There's plenty glad of that going on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. You bet. Thank you much. Bye. Bye.